There's a big discussion going on the web right now. Uh, you know, you look at Google, the question of all, you, buy, you pay for the same keywords, every, you know, yeah. you pay the same price no matter where you are, but if you get them at the bottom of the funnel, it's very valuable. If you get them at the top of the funnel, not so much. And exactly. So, that whole question of where do you find them in that process yeah. is really important. Search is still a cash them. cow, right? I mean, we all know that. But why? It's because when you're searching for something, the ads you see are directly related to what you're intending to see. Mm -hmm. It's not just who you are. It's where and when you right. are at that time. And so that's kind of what we wanted to seize on in healthcare. So how do you, so a lot of, a lot, there's a lot of talk, you know, in the, in the world about uh, validating your startup. Lean startup, MVP, you can talk yeah. about lots of different strategies. But at the end of the day, um, most companies fail because they scale it before they nail it, right? That's the biggest problem many of us have. And, I, you know, I've, I've been there, done that, you know, learned the hard way. Um, how did you guys validate this so, you know, up front? Because making the bet to leave school is a big bet. Yeah. And so um, what, you know, what gave you the, what was the process you went through to kind of be like, this isn't just a great idea, it's a great idea that will become a great, could become a great business. So I think we had very much of a testing culture, right? Maybe it's because we were in school at the time. Um, but Derek, uh, Shraddha, and I, we always talked in terms of who is affected by what we're doing. And so we had a couple of stools. Uh, it's a couple of legs to our stools, I'll say. So physicians were affected, medical practices. Patients were affected, right? Advertisers, as Pat just mentioned, right? Medical devices, pharmaceuticals, health foods, and then content companies. So we tried very hard to understand how would each of them be affected by what they were doing? What would they like about it? What wouldn't they like about it? And it was very, very scrappy in the beginning. Um, you know, we, we basically, Neil, I don't know if Neil's here, but the founder of Starter League over here, uh, he was our first uh, salesperson. He was our first sales intern. We all sat in our living room in Streeterville, and um, we were like, hey, here are the doctors we should sign up. Let's go do it. And so... He would sit in my mom's old car and drive uh, into the south side. We had Anna Geller and out Morningstar who drove into the, the northern suburbs, and we'd sign up doctor's offices. We got 50 of them, and then we started surveying their patients. Do you find this valuable? We started asking the doctors, do you find this valuable? They all said yes. So we said, well, will you pay for it? And they said no. And we said, well, why won't you pay for it if you find it valuable? And they said, well, because we don't get paid for it. And so, you know, there's, it's a fee-for-service model out there. This is great, but we don't get paid for it, and so we can't do it. It's, it's, we're not really accountable for education. And um, they didn't quite say it that way, but that's, right. that's what it was. So then we said, okay, we've got to monetize this somehow. We, we want to make gobs of money. And we were never shy about that in the beginning. We wanted to do tons of good and make tons of money, and we needed them always to, to be congruent with each other. And if one happened but the other didn't, we wouldn't want to do it. And so we said, okay, let's go get advertisers. And so with advertisers, they're all interested, but you have 10 screens, 20 screens, 30 screens. I don't care if it's a 51 ROI. You know, I don't, you know, 51 ROI and $100 is $5,000. That doesn't, that doesn't do anything for me. And so we figured out, okay, we're going to have to aggregate scale within a very specific type of office. And so I, I think hmm. a lot of it is we're big on iteration, lean startup, but, but you know, that's a great term. And, and, and they organized all that wisdom so well, but it comes down to listening. And then it comes down to always be closing. I was just talking to the audience, and they were talking about that. You know, you put a 1,000 shots up, and if none of them go in and they're all close, it's not valuable. And so you got to listen to customers, but then you got to choose what you're going to do and then really go close it and really go do it. And I think that's kind of what And how did you us. pick those markets, the markets you ended up picking? Because you really focus. You guys are extremely focused, even for a company at your stage. We are. A lot, of, a lot of times it's counterintuitive to people. One of the things I find you learn as a founder, you may know otherwise, is there's this, uh, uh, it's, there's this uh, specious sort of enticement to, to the fact that you say, if I go broader, it's a bigger market, yeah. I'll do better. And of course, um, you know, the more narrow you focus, as yeah. long as it has things adjacent to it, it actually works better. So you guys figured that out, and you figured out how to go narrow to get scale, which is we counterintuitive did. to people. How'd you pick those markets? What was it about yeah. them that, that made you say, and you know, not only for patients, but for other founders who are out there saying, you know, maybe I can't boil the ocean, I need to focus on a market. Yeah. What, what's the process you went through to kind of figure that out? I will say one, one thing on that is a lot of founders think they can only control the numerator, right? So how big they are, you know, how, how many screens do I have on? And we were, maybe this was a blessing, we were broke. We 
we didn't have much money. We weren't institutionally funded. We're a bootstrapped company. And so we couldn't always blow out the numerator. Um, so we decided to control the denominator, right? So if we were going to put up 1,000 offices, we didn't want them to be any office. Because 1,000 offices out of a million offices isn't worth much. That's just commoditized advertising. But 1,000 offices out of an available 3,000 offices is 33% market share. And if you pick the right 1,000 out of the 3,000, that means you're reaching more than half of who a brand wants to reach. And so a lot of times, you know, deciding to stay focused actually makes you bigger, not smaller. And I agree, it may seem counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but, but anytime somebody looks at a piece of information, it's only a fraction, right? I mean, the denominator contextualizes how big you are. How big you are just as five, as 15, and that doesn't mean anything, it's, it's share. And so did so, you look at how many specialist pra uh, areas did you look at yeah. to end up with these two? So we looked at um, about 11 specialties that focused, that were chronic condition care, um, that where lifestyle information would be very valuable. And we um, chose diabetes as the first one. We knew very quickly we can have more than 50% market share in that. When we went to cardiology, it was 10 times bigger, but at that point, we knew we can scale and grow um, and capture market share. Did you do it at the too. same time, or did you do cardiology? Cardiology a couple of years later. Got it. Yeah, so we first grabbed market share within diabetes, stayed absolutely focused. We had a lot of doctors who were calling, like, hey, this is great, can we have this? So we'll put you on a wait list, we'll get back to you when we have a product okay. targeted to you. So we did actually say no to make sure we stayed focused and really kind of kept going um, in that one direction and then started to go into second vertical, get market share, third vertical, get market share, and continue to grow that Got way. It. Interesting. Well, um, I want to go back into that, but you guys said something interesting earlier that I think a lot of people would like to know more about, which is this wasn't your first time being entrepreneurs. And so maybe you could tell us a little bit about uh, your early, your pre-context media. We know mm -hmm. about the, the magazine, which is still around. But uh, where did you get your entrepreneurial start, each of you individually? So. For me personally, it was really, I didn't know what entrepreneurship meant really until very recently. Growing up, what I did know, what I did grow up with was a sense of, and I thank my parents for this, for really going and doing anything I believed needed done. Um, I was six and I written an editorial to our local newspaper and I really brought Sorry, up the... Sorry, you were six? Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was writing... I so was like, I might have written mine in Cran, but okay. I was like, I, we keep hearing people complain that someone should do this, there needs to be a solution, someone needs to find where a better you, where way. Where did you live at the time? Where'd I lived in India at the okay. time. And where in India? Calcutta. Okay, so you're in Calcutta, you're six years old, and you're penning letters, letters to the editor. Yeah. All right, you're proud of <laughs> And it okay. got published, and because and the, the idea was, you know, instead of saying someone needs to do it, why don't we take action? Why are we a mm -hmm. society? And again, it was a very different community. Um, everyone was, you know, someone needs to find a solution. Everyone's pointing to the problem. Very few people just jump right into the pool and say, we'll find a solution. So what's we'll the first pool? You, I, I, I should commit, I, you know, I talked to these guys before, and so I heard this story, and uh, I, I heard about it. But you should share your first entrepreneurial business was? Uh, for me, I was in fourth grade, and I'd read my dad's entire library of books. Um, I needed more money. My parents were There are only so many these. newspapers you can write letters <laughs> to the editor to. I needed um, more pocket allowance, and my parents refused to increase that on a weekly <laughs> basis. So I took a notebook, drew some columns, took down an inventory of all my books and my dad's books, um, and started lending them out to my classmates. Um, so I just started my middle school library, which, which was uh, fun. What, what does a book cost? It was 50 pesos, um, and then I realized that some books got very popular, and you know, I now use big terms like inventory management. Um, but back then, it was you're like the I Uber need... surge yeah. pricing. <laughs> and there was dynamic interest rates. That's what you know you're an entrepreneur. <laughs> so I decided that the first three days would be 50 pesos. Fourth day onward, it would be a rupee, which was twice as much, and um, which meant at the end of the third day, I had all the books back, so I could actually create a list. All right, on this date you get the book, and on this date you nice. get the book. But and she'd collect. It. I mean, she'd go collect too. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be messing around with fourth grade trial. So, so now, Shra, then that wasn't your, that wasn't, uh, you had another business when you were young, right? Yeah. So tell us about that one. So, um, <laughs> my parents have visited I the I should have invested in your company time. starting then had I known <laughs> My parents have 
parents had just um, taken their first trip to the U.S. I grew up in India and Singapore, and uh, they returned with Toys R Us boxes for my brother and me. My brother got this really fun racetrack, so he was just building it. It was three-tiered. He could race cars, remote controls, and I got a dollhouse. Um, and some of you know that I'm very kind of why do girls get to play with dolls and guys get to build stuff? And I do think that the career choices and a lot of our later development depends on how we, the toys we play with when we're young. So I was bored with my dollhouse. And we had just started studying physics, and one of the chapters was on two-way circuits. I was like, this is great. Let me build a two-way circuit for my dollhouse. So and how old are you? I was in eighth grade at the time. Okay. And um, so I circuited my dollhouse, so I was so excited to show my parents. I was like, you know, when my dolls are going to sleep at night, they can turn the light on on the first floor, take the stairs, they don't have to walk in the dark, and the third floor, they can turn it off. It's a two-way circuit. And my mom was just like, what did you just do? Do you know how much we paid for this dollhouse? We carried it all the way from Philadelphia for you. Um, so she was very annoyed with me. So I took it to school, and I built it up, and I demonstrated it. My physics teacher didn't like me because I was asking a lot of why, but why? But why, not, why don't we do this? Is that really true? Is that really happen, or is that just a textbook? So I took it to the school principal, and I said, this is what I just did. Why don't we do more of this? Why don't we conduct experiments and learn by doing instead of just by um, reading about it? And so I ended up starting a science club, but I ended up also creating circuits and fans and lights for all my friends' dollhouses. Now, the part of the story I enjoy most, though, is she started selling the service. Right. So this wasn't she just, wasn't just a science experiment. experiment. The dollhouse world she in makes India. money, too. And so, so uh, she would go out and start marketing the, the rewiring of dollhouses to all the girls and get free labor from the science club of sorts <laughs> and pocket the money in the middle, which was the part I enjoyed most. I love that. What a story. You can't make this stuff up. It's too good. 